display. Um, I think I've said this before, but I was once a um, extra in a uh, TV show. Extra meaning that I was working at the Levy Institute, and they were having a TV show by uh, a man named William Buckley, who was a very uh, well-known, extremely conservative um, um, Republican, who had his TV show called Firing Line. And they did it at the Levy Institute, so they could have a debate between the Levy Institute people, who were Democratic Party, and Bill Buckley, who, and some senators who were Republican and conservative. But they didn't have enough people to show up. The Levy Institute was pretty isolated. So every, we were all required to come down, put on our jackets, and sit in the audience. So somewhere in TV land, you, you may see my face there. You'll probably see my expression also. But what I was really struck by, struck by, here you had the people who saw themselves as progressives, which were the post-Keynesians. And uh, the Levy is very strong on post-Keynesian economics, Minsky, Godley, uh, Ray now, and others. Uh, and, the new and, and the conservatives, political conservatives. The senator from Buffalo, New York, was running for president at that time. And Bill Buckley was a strong conservative. And a debate arose about what causes inflation. And consistent to their theory, the post-Keynesians said it's caused by labor. And consistent to their theory, the conservatives said it's caused by the state. And at one point, the senator from Buffalo, who was a very strong right-wing guy, said, you know, this is really insulting. I'm from the working class, and you're saying that we cause inflation. And the people you know, who are on the other side, who are uh, considered some liberals and supported the labor, are going, but isn't, they saw the state as something they had to defend. They said, it's not by the state. So that was the way they made. And I thought, there's something missing here. Uh, it, to me, it, because I started reading about inflation, it's pretty clear it's not caused by labor. But it, neither is it just caused by state spending and money supply. So the question is, and that led me to uh, create a seminar on inflation. One of the best ways you'll learn, uh, you'll learn to discover how, how to understand something is to teach it. Because then your ignorance is right up there. And over time, if you get to teach it more than once, you learn something. So the seminar on inflation led me to works by Cappy, Srapa, others, a long-term history. And then you have the question in front of you, which is this, how do we explain this? I don't see any way to explain this by rising monopoly power. I mean, that'd be a pretty extraordinary rise of monopoly power. And no measure comes even close to this kind of growth. So that throws that out. Uh, state intervention, no, that's Friedman, ultimately, that tried to provide an answer for that. But the idea that people who are, who are uh, knocking on the door trying to get jobs were really pretending because they had all the jobs or because their fellow workers had raised wages too high didn't seem plausible. And even many conservatives didn't accept that argument. Uh, so the question is where to go. And that led me to notice another thing, which was very common in that same debate. So that for both of them, both sides, inflation took place when there was full employment. I mean, that's clear. Friedman says, you increase the money supply, it will not have an impact on prices unless nominal prices, nominal GDP, which will increase when you increase the money supply, uh, is limited, uh, unless real GDP is limited, so that the rest of that increase goes into prices. And when asked, what is that limit, he says, ah, I assume full employment. But then it's OK. You have full employment uh, as a normal circumstance. You increase the money supply, you get inflation. The Keynesians say, no, no, no. We have unemployment as a normal circumstance. So if you increase the money supply or effective demand, you will get uh, more employment until you hit full employment, then you get inflation. For both of them, inflation is a full employment phenomenon. So then the third, when I began to study these things, it was already, uh, this was all happening in the 1980s, Keynesian theory had already fallen apart because it could not explain the fact that unemployment was getting, employment was getting uh, smaller, so unemployment was getting bigger, not smaller, and inflation was getting higher, not less. So right away you could see that uh, there was a problem to be resolved. How can you explain higher inflation with higher unemployment? Friedman jumped in and said, it's not really higher unemployment. It's full employment. And then that saved the, the neoclassical argument. But the, to me, that made no sense looking at it on the ground, seeing people who are unemployed. Um, so that led to the question of how uh, can you explain the rise in the unemployment rate? And at the same time, the rise of the inflation rate. In my earliest paper on inflation, which is about the 1980s, I, I plot the, this exact graph. My first thought was, well, OK. the uh, we need another theory of the limits to real GDP growth. Because if nominal growth is pulled up by purchasing power, then what causes real GDP growth? And I had already written in my dissertation something which came back to become relevant, um, which was that if you look in uh, Ricardo, the limit to growth of an economy in Ricardo is not employment of labor, but the degree to which you can put the surplus product back into. In Ricardo's corn corn model, you have corn input, corn for labor, and a corn surplus. That surplus can be used to expand the corn input and employment of labor, 
and the rest of it consumed by the capitalists, the more you use it to expand, the faster the growth rate. So the limit is when all of the surplus goes back to uh, people involved in production, which could be the capitalist as you know, uh, uh, people working in the production process or supervising it or whatever. So the maximum growth rate is when the profit, when the surplus goes back, which is equivalent to saying the maximum growth rate is a profit rate. Well, in my dissertation, I'd also read uh, uh, Marx for my dissertation, and the schemes of reproduction in Marx, you'll notice, have a different potential growth rates. Once you formalize that, you can easily see that the maximum growth rate is when all surplus value goes back. And that I knew from having studied other things in, in graduate school was that this is von Neumann ray. So von Neumann, Marx, and Ricardo had another theory of the limits to growth. And it took me no more than 25 years to put it together into a theory of inflation. Because all these different elements had to be sorted out. By that time, I'd already figured this part out, but I ran into another problem. So by the 1980s, it was already seemed to me that the first answer was that inflation will be correlated with the tightness of the economy, and the tightness is this growth utilization rate, so the two variables should move well together. And I, I think I wrote an article somewhere in the late 80s or early 90s or something, so my part of the graph was up to here, not this part. I hadn't, didn't have the data yet, and it looked pretty good. But then as I ran the inflation seminar, it also became clear to me that that wouldn't work for countries like Argentina, wouldn't work for the hyperinflation cases, and so on, because it wasn't just the tightness of the economy. There was something else. And that something else was the pull. And that led me to realize that there was all along in the classical tradition, and in fact in other traditions, the idea of pull and resistance. The pull comes from the creation of new purchasing power, and almost everybody says that leads to growth of nominal output, uh, on average. And the resistance comes from some inability to grow. And here we have three candidates. The lack of availability of labor, so that's the unemployment rate. The lack of availability of capacity, so capacity utilization rate. And the one variable that nobody seems to have noticed for 100 years or so, which is the growth utilization rate. And when I realized that, I realized that there was this explanation which was sensible. They make sense of the data. They also explained why, even though here these two move together very well, here the inflation rate is lower than the growth utilization rate. So what was going on there? And that led me to propose what I propose here, which is this push-pull model. Push, or rather, pull resistance model. And then, of course, having been early trained as an engineer, I know that a pull on something generates resistance, and resistance is typically nonlinear. So you have to keep in your mind that a spring will expand fairly linearly in, when you pull on it, but as it gets tighter in its ability to pull, then that uh, reaction becomes highly nonlinear. At some point, it won't expand at all. It's reached its limit. Okay? So all of these elements were there all along. And they arose out of asking a simple question, you know, and I always use the data for that question. Uh, that's why I show so many graphs here. I mean, I could do regression after regression, you won't see anything. The main point is you look at the data and it asks you a question. Why do these two not move together here and why do they move together here? Why do they not move together in the in, uh, Korean War? Those kinds of questions require you to, to think in broader than dummy variables. And my interest always was generality. So uh, Alberto's dissertation took on in 24 countries, or no, 10, 12 countries, whatever I said, a large number of countries. Um, uh, Pragavi's dissertation, Robert Murthy's dissertation, was 24 countries, and each time learning and refining the implications of what was a basic hypothesis for quite some time, a long period of time. So after some 20 years, I could feel comfortable writing it up and relating it to other things. I work very slowly, unfortunately. Okay, any other questions? I once talked to Robert Solo about this, uh, and I said, you know, he was writing a book. Uh, he was uh, editing a book, and he said, do you know anybody who has any explanation of inflation? I said, oh, me, but he didn't want to hear that. Uh, when I explained it to him, he didn't make any sense. For him, the von Neumann ray was a balanced growth path with everything perfect, and you can have a traverse from one to the other, so the idea that it could be a limit. And uh, to be honest, I didn't send it to him either, because I didn't think he would pick it up. Uh, so it, that was at least 10 or 15 years before it came out here. I published it in, in, in a book, as a book essay. But uh, in the seminar, a lot of people did papers on it for different countries, Sweden, France, Germany, Italy. And uh, you could see this kind of curve that I was talking about, the, uh, um, the through, what at that point I call the throughput curve. We would typically compare for a country the relationship between inflation on the vertical axis and uh, 1 minus sigma on the horizontal axis, and then compare the same uh, inflation data with the unemployment rate, which is the equivalent logical term in the Keynesian. You, and you always found the unemployment rate, the Phillips curve thing didn't work, and this was a kind of classical Phillips curve. 
and you know, there's really nothing in the theory, I think, even in, well, I don't think, uh, I don't know if Keynes would have understood this because the idea of growth in the physical economy wouldn't have, but Sraffa would surely have understood this. It's a natural dual to Sraffa's treatment of prices and production. And many Sraffians did, in fact, build growth models from the dual of Sraffa's prices. So the literature was always there. It just wasn't put together for this question. That's partly because much of the work in the Sraffian and in the neoclassical tradition was about balanced growth and optimal paths and traverses and not really about the empirical phenomena. And the theory was constructed in such a way that they really, looking at data was vulgar. You didn't really, as I say, I come from an engineering background. For me, not looking at data is vulgar. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, Do you? Uh, I'm sort of grappling with this idea of there being a, a limit to, to, because I understand that the, that the rate of profit gives you uh, a sense of the, the global surplus value that is available and that is capable of being invested productively. And uh, that if you add uh, beyond that limit or as you approach that limit, uh, that purchasing power goes into inflationary processes. What happens if you think of endogenous or as a credit or other kinds of endogenous money that could possibly be directed to the creation of new surplus value, which is not currently available, but which could go into productive processes before it is uh, realized as a surplus value? And would that not uh, possibility the, the growth or the expansion uh, by the introduction of new purchasing power, even as you approach the, this, uh, this limit? Yes, but think of it differently. Suppose I ask you the question, suppose that we just consider abstractly different rates of growth uh, in a balanced growth path. Then leaving aside the question whether the money is there to call that then you can quickly see that there is a limit to the balance rate of growth, and that's the rate of growth uh, of the, uh, with, that is the profit rate. And that kind of argument comes from von Neumann. The maximum balance rate of growth is when all of the surplus, physical surplus is going in the uh, actually proper proportions into every sector. Now, Passanetti, in a section which I cite in my book, makes a very interesting point. Suppose growth rates are different as they are normally. Then, as the economy's average growth rate gets higher, the difference in the growth rates has to be smaller because you start to hit bottlenecks. And those bottlenecks will limit the growth of everyone else. And the maximum growth rate is actually the lowest growth rate that is feasible from individual sectors, because it's going to be the bottleneck that dominates everything. So the range of feasible growth rates in the average becomes smaller as the average gets bigger, and it approaches what is called, what personally shows is a, is a physical limit to each sector's growth using uh, vertically integrated sectors or subsystems, uh, another way to do that. So that's a very interesting argument, because that says that we'd expect bottlenecks to pop up more the higher the growth rate. And that hasn't been investigated as far as I know, but it could be. That's why I showed the data on growth rates earlier, uh, uh, I think last lecture, uh, on the US economy itself. You can see that the growth rates don't run away from each other. They stay, whoops, I didn't realize I run over. My apologies, I'll stop right now. They run over, they, uh, they stay within some, these are growth rates of the US economy in different industries. It was 1987 to 2010, that's all that we have data for, and you can see the dark line is the average growth rate, and the individual lines are the growth rates of different sectors. And this is two different sets of sectors. You can see they're quite different. But what's quite striking is that you know, at the first level, they seem to also cycle around some common element. And analytically, you can show that you cannot grow faster for any sustained period than the maximum growth rate. And this problem came up not theoretically. It came up practically in the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union was struggling to put its economy together and gear up for a war, they had plenty of people, so there's no limit there. They had plenty of people to use. The problem was, how fast could they grow? Well, no industry could go faster than its inputs. But the inputs depend on the inputs of some other industry and using input output tables, which they invented. They were able to show that the maximum practical growth rate came from the structure of production, even if you had the demand to. And they could create the demand for it. They could order it. So that's the important point. So the pull is the effective demand part, but the limit is the physical growth rate. Anyway, next time.